Coming up on the Long Island Business Report, America faces a trillion dollar shortfall in funding for public employee pensions, leaving cities from coast to coast crippled under the weight of pension obligations. Pensions are long-term investments, and the problem overall is that we're taking short-term approaches to them. We take a look at the pension debate that is unfolding right here on Long Island. You, you have to create rainy day funds. You have to take a conservative view if you really want to protect the pensioners. It's all straight ahead on this edition of the Long Island Business Report. Funding for this program has been made possible by David Colon and by viewers like you. And now from Malloy College at the Madison Theater, here's Jim Paymar with the Long Island Business Report. Hello and thank you for being with us. I'm Jim Paymar with the Long Island Business Report. Following the economic crash of 2008, public pension reform has emerged as a major challenge for many states and local governments who have overpromised and underfunded their pension systems. Joining me today to discuss the implications for Long Island and the road ahead is Richard Ravitch, the former Lieutenant Governor of New York State and co-chair of the State Budget Crisis Task Force, and Larry Levy, Executive Dean of the National Center for Suburban Studies at Hofstra University. Richard, Larry, thank you so much for being with us thank today. You. Thank you. Uh, this pension issue is coast to coast. We see cities like Detroit and Stockton going into bankruptcy. How bad is the situation here, Richard, in New York State and in Long Island in particular? No way comparable yet to uh, Stockton or Detroit. Uh, what's happening universally is that retirement uh, expenditures of state and local governments are rising faster than revenues are. So it's not just pensions, it's also the health care obligations that states and cities have have contractually agreed to with their employees. So for example, New York State has $65 billion of unfunded health care liability. New York City has $100 billion of, mm. of unfunded health care liability. I don't know the numbers for Nassau County, I'm sorry to say. but. <clears throat> You, there's certain basic principles, I think. One, to me at least, there is a total moral equivalency between a promise to pay interest to somebody who lends you money and a promise to pay a benefit to somebody who worked for you for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So those people that think that they can solve these fiscal crises by cutting pensions are, are, have both legal obstacles and moral obstacles, in my judgment. Uh, but certainly legal obstacles, and particularly in New York State, where there's a constitutional provision that guarantees the payment of, of benefits. Uh, Larry, um, let me ask you, uh, you're Dean of Suburban Studies at Hofstra University, but in your prior life, 35 years on the street as a reporter and columnist uh, and editorial writer at uh, Newsday. Um, how did Nassau and Suffolk County get into the dilemma that we're in today? Well, it was a matter of overpromising, as you said in the opening, and underfunding. There was a lack of uh, courage on the part of public officials going back a long time uh, to say, look, this is what we're going to need to pay, not only now, but in the future, and this is how we're going to have to pay it. And if that means raising taxes, then it means raising taxes. Uh, the local governments, though, can't be blamed uh, uh, for most of it because the pensions are largely controlled by the state legislature. And originally that was done because uh, uh, the wisdom of our founding fathers or, or, or our, our, certainly our elders, uh, they thought that the legislature having statewide uh, purview would be more responsible and uh, have the, the, the strength to stand up to uh, local unions when they made their demands, as they're paid to do, uh, it didn't work out that way. Mm -hmm. The legislature, it wasn't so much the basic pension obligation, it was all the sweeteners that would come in year after year after year that ratcheted up the obligation. Richard, that Republicans from Nassau County voted for with the same vigor as uh, liberal Democrats in the assembly. That, that's right. In New York, it's very different than a lot of other places in the country and certainly in Congress. Labor around the country is seen as an ally of the Democrats mm -hmm. and an enemy of the Republicans. On Long Island and in much of New York State, that's just not the case. It's incumbents 
when, when incumbents are in power and they want peace from their uh, workers, when they want to have uh, 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 allies in, in, in certain projects that they need to get through their respective boards of supervisors or legislatures, they will go to their unions and basically say, what do you need? And the unions will tell them. And oftentimes it comes with sweeteners. It comes with uh, not touching their health benefits, uh, certainly not touching pensions. And it becomes a problem that gets replicated over and over and over again. Isn't it dangerous that we put billions and billions of dollars of pension funds into the stock market? The vagaries of the stock market, we saw what happened in 2008. That seems to be what was killing well, us for the last five years on this. Actually, the, the truth of the matter is that historically it was generally viewed to be uh, prudent to have about 70% in the bond market and 30% in the equity market. But today, because they are underfunding these pension funds because of the pressure, the budgetary pressures at the governmental levels, they're underfunding these, these pension contributions. Mm -hmm. So the pressure to put more of the fund itself into equities has grown enormously. The risk of doing that is not adequately uh, taken into account in measuring or evaluating whether these funds are going to ultimately be able to pay the benefits that they exist for. Larry. But, but in the long run, the stock market has, when I mean, you're talking 20 or 30 year period, long the stock market will produce the biggest gains. You just have to do it prudently. One of the problems for local governments in New York State is that they don't plan for the downturns. For many years, local governments were asked to contribute nothing mm -hmm. into the state pension fund because the stock market was booming. The state controller had more than enough money to meet the fiduciary responsibility of fully funding the pension. We're one of the few states that's fully funded. Uh, I'm not sure you're right. Uh, well, we, I don't think we're going to be able to settle unless somebody wants to Google it off, off camera. But uh, we have, uh, the, the controller sends local governments a bill in many years those bills were zero. Mm -hmm. Did any local government during that time put money away saying, you know what, one day the market's going to go down, the control or our obligations are going to go up as the baby boomers begin to go into it. Maybe we should be putting money away when inevitably the controller asks us to make a contribution. Stock market crashes. The controller, in order to meet his obligation, says to local governments, okay, the free ride's over. I need 11% from you, I need 16% from you, I need 18% from you, whatever those numbers were. And local governments were flailing and saying, well, we don't have the money. Well, it's true they didn't have the money at that time, but they had the money at another time and didn't plan. And this is part of the lack of vision, the lack of foresight, the lack of courage to take care of, to see over the future and take care of those obligations. Well, Richard, you didn't tell the audience the next chapter. Okay. As a result of those pressures, the state passed a law in 2010 and another in 2012 that gave the state itself, the cities in this state, and the school districts the ability to make the contributions by giving promissory notes. So the state pension system now has uh, close to $3 billion of assets that are promissory notes bearing an interest rate far lower than what they say the earnings are or the discount rate they use to determine the adequacy of the pension funding. They call it pension smoothing, but there is no responsible group of act actuaries who think that this is properly called pension smoothing. This right. is utter, that, that, utter that, nonsense. Right. That's an example of politics intruding on the pension system. Even the ones that are uh, uh, designed or at least presented as a way of helping out local governments really puts them into a deeper hole, if not today, then down the road. Richard, uh, you were lieutenant governor. Uh, you go back to the New York crisis of the 1970s. Today we're borrowing from the pension funds themselves in order to make payments to the pensioners. Correct. How? how no, in order to that? make the contributions to the pension fund, there's right. still enough, obviously, plenty of liquidity and cash to make the sure, but pension benefits. Is that, is that sustainable payments. to keep doing that? No. Unless we get lucky. 
<laughs> we get lucky. What the market can continues market to goes go to twenty thousand. The economy goes on a, an unprecedented run for years and years and years, and uh, we're rolling in cash. Yeah, but Richard, uh, people are talking about uh, the fact that we might be in another bubble and we could be in for, for a ten or twenty percent correction in the market. So I then, have, what happens to these funds? I have no prescience about the economic future. That's not my <laughs> smart I don't guy. have a crystal ball. Smart guy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I, it's a risk that is very worrisome, which is why uh, Larry made the major point, which is you, you have to create rainy day funds. You have to make, create reserves to deal with the downtimes. You have to take a conservative view if you really want to protect the pensioners. And, you know, an uh, important point to make you mentioned Detroit before. The big controversy in Detroit would, is going to be whether or not the pensions get paid uh, ahead of the debt that the city of Detroit incurred. Mm -hmm. The bondholders and note holders are saying we should come first. The retirees are saying we ought to come first. And we have a constitutional provision in Michigan that says we're entitled to come first. Mm -hmm. We're guaranteed our benefits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, same provision the New York State Constitution has. However, whether or not the federal bankruptcy statute preempts the state constitution is a legal issue that will go to the Supreme Court sometime in the next four years. So I do not believe that the pension benefits are necessarily as sacrosanct in practice as people think they are. Larry, some people who are receiving pensions are receiving more in pension than they received as salary when they were working. I, I don't think that, I, I think that you would have to really search with a magnifying glass to find that. I did. You I know, we've got, we've got <laughs> millions and millions of pensioners. I mean, the average pension recipient in the state is something like twenty five, thirty thousand dollars a year. But some of the pensioners who, uh, with overtime and sick pay and vacation pay, and they pile it all up and they work for over 40 years, they're actually receiving more in pension than they did in salary. Well, I, you maybe, know, maybe not everyone. That's, that's you know, not the I, case. I mean, there's a couple of ways to answer that. One is that you could say they shouldn't do it that way. But if somebody worked legitimately mm -hmm. worked, and what, there's a game that's played. Right. But if somebody legitimately worked all those overtime hours, and the contract negotiated said that goes into your pension, well, then they then they deserve it. But the reality is that in in some cases, uh, you'll notice that the overtime load happens to be uh, 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 falling in uh, uh, cops, for example, in, in Nassau County, mm -hmm. on people about to retire. Mm -hmm. And they've tried to deal with that to allow you that your last year uh, of, of overtime doesn't dictate it. That's got to be over a period of years. But again, there are a lot of games that are played that take the original deals that were cut and make them far uh, you know, less beneficial to, to taxpayers. But you know, th this, is, this discussion on pensions is really part of a bigger problem of, of, of finding elected officials who have the vision and the courage and the communication skills to be able to sell the idea of looking farther down the road because we have to decide what do we want to accomplish as a people. I don't want to sound like a minister or anything like that, but, but we need to build bridges. We need to build public transportation systems. We have our, our, our airports, by and large, are a joke compared to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, we're falling way, way behind in terms of that competitiveness. We also need to be investing in education. These are the workers that are going to remain competitive. There's no way to do that without being willing to sacrifice whether it's not doing uh, as much in other areas or coming up with a rational revenue plan, whether uh, if it's in the local level, introducing a local income tax, whether it is uh, 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 you know, demanding more of public employees, mm -hmm. whatever it is, we've got to start looking to the future and we've got to start thinking bigger and longer. Richard, what are the options? What can we do? You've sat in Albany, You've been part of the discussion. What, what can well, we do? Uh, I agree with everything Larry said. It, it does require people in politics to be courageous, to tell the public the truth, mm -hmm. to stop kicking the can down the road. The incentives to kick 
the can down the road for somebody in politics is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. I tried in my brief tenure in Albany to change the budgeting system uh, to require that the state budget in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Mm -hmm. That was the most significant thing we did in 1975 to put the city on a, on a straight path. And the city of New York, which budgets that way, their recurring revenues match their recurring expenditures, has not had a fiscal crisis since 1975. Mm -hmm. Well, if you were a czar right now and you could implement changes that could get us out of this morass, what would they be? Give me three ideas. I would change the budgeting system. I'd change the fiscal year from uh, March 31st to June 30th because we don't even know what our tax collections are going to be when we have to decide a budget in New York State. Uh, uh, I'd require budgeting in accordance with GAAP. I would require four-year projections uh, to, to, submit, to be submitted as part of the budget and for the legislature to, to uh, change that. And I how would, would this help the I would give prices. the governor. I would give the governor power to deal with uh, problems that come up during a fiscal year to reduce spending if necessary, if events have caused a decline in, um, in, uh, in revenue. Mm -hmm. um, and this would, this would help to resolve the pension crisis? No, but the pension crisis is not in and of its, that's not where the crisis is. Mm -hmm. The crisis is at the level of the budgets of state and local governments. Mm -hmm. The pension crisis only exists if you want to make uh, the payments that you promised to make, which I believe government should, mm -hmm. um, morally and, and every other which way. Um, if you want to do it, you have to get big contributions in periods of low economic activity. But the politicians don't want to make the big contributions because that crowds out other kinds of expenditures which they think are, in fairness to them, are more important. Mm -hmm. And that's where the conflict is. It's at the budget process. It's not in the management of the pension funds. Larry, should the employee be paying more in terms of pension contributions well, versus the, the employer? The employees now are play, paying a pretty hefty amount, uh, pay almost as much as I pay into at, at Hofstra, which is a private business in a sense, right. a private not-for-profit. Um, I, you know, if I were the czar, and you didn't ask me, but, I, but I'm going <laughs> to volunteer this, uh, and I mean, I'm a real czar where I don't have to negotiate yeah, exactly. with this politician or that union. Um, I would, I would uh, 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 essentially require all employees to contribute a share of, to the share of the pension that is the average in the private sector. I would um, um, not allow changes for one special interest or another that disrupts the projections when the original deals were made. I, I would uh, a allow uh, potential pensioners to uh, have uh, a 401k in addition to their safety net pension. But the 401k then puts you back in the market. And the, the but but if, you, if, you, uh, you know, if you only do a portion of it, mm -hmm. in some cases they're going to do better. In some cases they, they may not do as well. But again, pensions are long-term investments. Mm -hmm. And the problem overall is that we're taking short-term approaches to them, whether it's the, the um, uh, fixes that, that Richard was talking about, the smoothing, I keep thinking of smoothies where they put a banana in there and they put, you know, and they grind it all up and it's supposed to taste and look good, but it only, it's going to cause indigestion way down the road. Right. You know, uh, so, you know, again, uh, it, the, the pension is, it, it's, if you want to, you can't look at the pensions in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And there are any number of areas where, where local government, state government need to figure out a way to look down the road. And to be honest with the taxpayers and to be courageous and not worrying if they're going to not get elected because somebody's going to accuse them of, of raising taxes and, and do the right thing. We need to invest in our kids. We need to invest in our infrastructure in, in many, many ways. And we're not doing that. And we're going to pay a price for that in a lack of economic development and, 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 in, and in unfulfilled lives that is going to cost us in ways you can't even put on a, ba you, you can put on a balance sheet and beyond. What do you think, Richard? Well, I, again, I uh, wish I could find a point of disagreement with 
what Larry said, but I can't. Mm -hmm. I, I can only add to it by saying that fundamentally, uh, uh, we made a lot of promises in this country. Uh, we were always filled with a great deal of optimism. Right. We had a level of economic growth. We're a generous culture, a generous society. We made a lot of promises. And now we're finding out we can't afford to keep all the promises we made. Uh, and that's why there's this conflict in Washington over the federal deficit, and why there's a crunch at a state and local level over pensions versus education spending versus infrastructure, et cetera. So you sort of have to bear in mind certain fundamental principles. One, uh, despite the Tea Party, we need good people in government. Government is an essential part of our economic, social, uh, existence in this society and we want talented people and one of the ways to induce talent to come into public services historically has been to provide them with a uh, retirement so I believe in the defined benefit plan but isn't it but isn't it breaking the back of so many taxpayers here in Nassau and Suffolk County uh, when when pension obligations nobody, nobody likes to pay more taxes no, but I we're paying more that. property taxes when the when uh, the pension uh, can pensions cannot be paid uh, the school districts are having to cut back to pay teachers more in in their pensions I mean what do we how do we reform this I I think the the answer is you have to make a tough choice and that is you want to attract talented people into the teaching profession mm -hmm. uh, that you got to provide them with job security and retirement benefits mm -hmm. so you have to balance these things off and I, you cannot rule out additional revenue as part of a solution i'm not saying it should all be paid for out of new revenue but if new revenue isn't part of the uh... solution um, and a reduction in other things, other kinds of government expenditures, it's got to be a package. And, and Larry, and where yeah, I, new I, revenues, I, I, I mean, where, well, where, well, where I, are we going to get I, them? I, let me frame it another way. I think the problem in an in a, in a island-wide sense is that it's not so much that we're paying too much in taxes. I know people will say, what are you talking about? We're paying the wrong taxes. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, a, a, a family... Uh, earning $100,000 a year and living in a, an $800,000 house is going to pay only twice the taxes, uh, oh, half the taxes of a family that, where, where the guy may be on Wall Street earning a million a year in a, a $1.6 million house. Mm -hmm. Because we're basing it on property taxes, not on what people have an ability to pay. So if we went to a local income tax that substituted for a portion of the property tax, middle class people would be paying a lower percentage of their income and wealthier people would be paying a higher percentage of their income. The problem is the burden. We have people earning very little money. We have retirees earning next to nothing but living in houses that have a property tax bill the same as somebody who is earning a lot of money mm -hmm. simply because the houses are worth the same. But how <coughs> can you recreate a system that's been in place for decades? With, with, with intelligent, courageous politicians. And where are they? Well, they, they, <laughs> that's the crux of the issue. How to encourage bright young people to go into politics and to do the right thing and tell the public the truth. I believe the public can stand the truth. You know, income taxes were 30% higher in the state of New York during a period of, of great prosperity and great economic growth. Uh, I don't know anybody in the commercial world, and I spent most of my life in business, uh, <clears throat> whose greed was diminished one iota by high taxes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, um, and and, and uh, this has to be analyzed. A, a frighteningly low percentage of Americans pay income tax. Mm -hmm. um, in, on Long Island, about half of the state income taxes that are sent to Long Island are paid by about 5% of the people. 5% of the people, possibly even, let, even fewer than that. No, it's not even close that 50% that of the property tax burden is paid by the 5% of the wealthy. So we have this dis 
disparate. I mean, in New York City, which has a local income tax, which is booming, you don't see wealthy people moving out because they're paying another 1% of a vast income. New York City has an, an enormous amount of its services paid by relatively few people mm -hmm. and businesses. The city captures that money. Long Island does not capture that money. So I think we have to start thinking um, not so much about cutting. Yeah, you have to cut the real waste out. You have to cut the abuses like somebody sure. padding their pension right. in the last year by having overtime worked or not. But in the end, we, we have services that need to be performed. We have obligations, as Rich was talking about, that need to be met. We are taxing people in a way that puts a, an enormous burden on middle class, lower middle class homeowners. And we need to find a way to capture the incredible wealth that's on the island that does not go to local governments. Richard, we have about a minute left. I'd like to give you about 30 seconds each to, so, to wrap this up. Uh, the pension problem going forward. If nothing is done, if structural changes are not made soon, what do you see in the next five to 10 years? I don't see structural changes being made in the pension system. I see structural changes being made in the way states and local governments budget. That's where the problem is. It's mm -hmm. not primarily with the pension system. Mm -hmm. It's with the relevant amount of revenue to meet the obligations and promises that we have made as a society. And that's what we have to conjure with. Otherwise, yes, pensioners will get hurt, retirees will get hurt, and a lot of other people will get hurt in the process. Larry? Well, New York State retirees are going to get their money because of the Constitution and political pressures uh, that the uh, growing number of elderly people with the baby boomers uh, graying uh, are, are, are going to be able to bring to the system. But uh, we're going to have to find ways to, uh, find, we're going to have to find revenues to pay for this, and we're going to have to cut services uh, that are not quite as essential. Mm -hmm. uh, whether this is a big problem or a small problem in the next five to 10 years, if that's your window, depends on how the economy is doing. Because if the stock market for some reason keeps going and it's not the bubble that, that, that you, you think it, it could be, then um, the local governments will be asked to pay less and less and less because they're being bailed out by, by growth in, in stocks and bonds. Mm -hmm. uh, if the market tanks, we're in for, you know, I, I don't even know what to call it, Armageddon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that doesn't sound good. No. <laughs> I hate to leave it on that note, but we have to. I want to thank you both uh, for being with us today. That wraps up our conversation on the public pension crisis here on Long Island. Thanks uh, to Richard and Larry for being with us. And please tune in next week as we continue to address the future of public pensions and what reform, if any, is needed. For more on the Long Island Business Report, log on to our website. You can also find us on Facebook and join the conversation on Twitter. I'm Jim Paymar. Thank you for joining us for this edition of the Long Island Business Report, and we'll see you next time. Funding for this program was made possible by David Cologne and by viewers like you.